And so here we have Tola and Jar, and they kept the peace for about 45 years. And the biblical text, once we start in chapter 10, tells us that these two guys judged Israel. And we don't know much about them. Like I said, we only get a few verses that talk about their judging over Israel. Uh, but it's interesting here because uh, these men judge one for 22 years, one for 23 years. We get two verses. Uh, we get three chapters on Jephthah. He judges for six years. And so he judges for one of the least amount of times the judges, but he has three chapters devoted to what takes place in his lifetime. And so here we have uh, Israel's apostasy, the fifth edition. This is going to be the fifth time in the book of Judges that the Israelites go back to apostasy. And this is going to be the worst low that we've seen for Israel so far. And so let's read verses 6 through 16 as it talks about their apostasy before God. Verses 6 through 16. Yes. Uh, great question. Uh, the very first uh, judge that we're introduced to takes place about um, takes place about 1300. And so this is taking place right at about 1100. And so there's been about 200 years since our first judge. And so in about 200 years, they've gone into apostasy majorly five times. And so uh, the track record has not been very good for the Israelites. Uh, great question, great question. And so, uh, I appreciate Brother Randy asking that question because I forgot to mention the time frame. Uh, Jephthah takes place about 118 when the um, Amorites start to uh, control the people of Israel. They control them for 18 years, and then he leads them for six years after he rids the Amorites. Uh, I'm sorry, the Ammonites. And so, that in about 1094 is when he dies. Uh, a good other question is, about the same time this takes place is when Samson starts judging on the other side of Israel. And also Eli has already started to uh, lead Israel as a, as a judge and a prophet. And so whenever we get to the book of Samuel and we start talking about Eli and Samuel, Eli has already started to be a prophet and somewhat of a judge type character at this same time. And so really we're starting to mold from this idea of the judges and pretty soon within about 50 years of this taking place right here that we're going to be reading, you have the first king in Saul. And so we're kind of closing that chapter, if you will, on the judges and starting towards the monarchy. So great, great question about the timeline. Uh, verses 6 through 16. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherahs and the gods of Syria and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve Him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and He sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. And for 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan and the land of the Ammonites. Amorites, which is Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because you have, we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people, and the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not say from the time of the Egyptians and from the Amorites and save you from them and the Ammonites and the Philistines, the Sidonians and also the Amalekites and the Moanites oppressed you and, they, and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand? Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods and therefore I will save you no more. Go and cry out to those gods to whom you have chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only Please deliver us to this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. And so here we have this fifth apostasy that is mentioned, and it is a uniquely new low for the children of Israel. Here we have a longer list mentioned of foreign gods than we have previously. In the previous four apostasies mentioned in the book of Judges, it mentions other gods, but here is the longest list that we have of the foreign gods that these people are serving, showing us this is a new low for them. Also, another unique first in the book of Judges, this is the first time that it says that they forsook and abandoned Yahweh. Now, one of the things that we've mentioned before through the book of Judges is, is that the children of Israel normally did not, when we think about the apostasy of the Old Testament, oftentimes we think they forsook God completely and, and served other gods, where most of the time that wasn't the case. They served Yahweh and the other gods in the region, which 
Of course, just like Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, God wants all or nothing. He doesn't want to be served with the Canaanite gods. He wants to be served only Himself. And so here's the first time in the book of Judges that it says that they forsook Him completely. And so this was a new low for the children of Israel. And as we can see in the book of Judges, each time they go into apostasy, it gets worse and worse each time. And so each time they fall further away from God. When they were enslaved by the Midianites and Gideon was, was risen up to take care of the Midianites, does anybody remember how long it took them to come to their senses? It's been several weeks ago, so you might want to take a guess. If you're not right, it's okay. It's, it's been weeks. And so anybody want to just throw their hand out there? How many years? Not 50 or 40. Seven. It took seven years. Okay. Not a bad guess. Seven years. How long did it take this time? Anybody remember how long they oppressed them? 18 years, yeah. And so now, not only are they becoming even more wicked and serving even more foreign gods and forsaking God completely, it's taking even longer for them to come to their senses. And so, as you can see, it becomes a new low each and every time for the children of Israel. And so, God brings them to a greater oppression. This is the first time in the book of Judges that more than one nation is said to have been raised up. In the previous four apostasies, there has been one nation that God raised raised up against the people of Israel. And so he raised up the, um, uh, the, the Midianites, or he raised up uh, another kingdom, uh, the, um, um, the ones from, down from Mesopotamia. Uh, but here, God raises up two nations. What are those two nations? That's right, the Philistines and the Ammonites. One is on the west side, which is the... Well, this is east. Well, this is your west, right? Okay. So on the west side, he raises up which nation? The Philistines. That's right. And on the east side, he raises up the Ammonites. So now instead of raising up one oppressor from one part around Israel, he raises up two oppressors on both sides of Israel. And so they become swamped. And they say, uh, another unique first here in Judges. You didn't know there were so many firsts in Judges 6. This is the first time that the children of Israel tell God to His face, We have sinned. Now, previously in the book of Judges, they've said, you know, Lord, come save us. We're sorry. This is the first time that they say, we have sinned. And so they say, do with us what you will. And so if you look, it says that God became uh, tired of their misery. And so this is one of the strongest acts of repentance that the Israelites do. The text tells us that they took all of the foreign gods and they threw them away. And so, unlike previously, when God delivered them, and we could see through the life of like Gideon, where they continue to act like Canaanites, it seems like the repentance here may have been stronger, because they take all the foreign gods they have in their homes, uh, in their places of worship, and they throw them all away. That's their act of repentance, that fruit in keeping with repentance. And that's what causes God to, uh, to redeem them, if you will, to raise up someone to help them out. Um, any questions on chapter 10? Isaac, yes. Said, the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, usually, you know, in times past, he had spoke through Moses and Elijah and others. Mm -hmm. Who was the spokesperson here? Do you think? Yeah. The sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Is that just yeah. A host of people. Yeah, I think here is probably talking about the, the consensus of the people coming to their senses and saying, we need some sort of divine intervention, that we need to go back to Yahweh. Now we do know, like in the case of Gideon, that a prophet was sent beforehand uh, to help stir the people and to kind of get them on the right track. Uh, then, of course, the angel of the Lord goes to Gideon. Uh, here we're not told of a, of a specific prophet uh, to, that initiates that type of repentance, that call to arms. Um, there may have been some prophets there, we're just not told in the story. Uh, here in, in chapter 10. It's a good question. Yeah. And so it must have been through a prophet. There had to be some sort of spokesman that was talking to them. Um, as I mentioned before, Eli is actually already working right now uh, as a prophet. And so it very well could have been Eli himself uh, that was talking to the people. Um, but we just, we just don't know. In the book of Samuel, we'll see that Eli is already working as a prophet during this time. And so it, it may have been Eli. It may have been somebody else. It just, it's hard to say because the text just doesn't tell us. So it's an interesting question, though. 
Good comment. Anyone else? No? All right, let's go to chapter 11. Here before we go to chapter 11, you can see on this map, you can see here um, Gad, uh, or Gilead is right here. It's going to be the purple on the Transjordan. It's going to be right there, as you can see, in between Reuben and Manasseh. They're on the top. And so here you can see the number six, I believe, and see the Ammonites going to be coming in. But also on the other side of the Jordan, you can see the Philistines right there. They're going to be coming in. I believe that's number three on the list down there towards the bottom, how they're sweeping in. And so here you can see this kind of two-pronged attack on both sides of the kingdom of the people of Israel be, uh, becoming uh, enswamped or engulfed with the Philistines and the uh, Am 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 Ammonites. And so the Ammonites are going to be uh, delivered by Jephthah. Anybody know who's going to deliver uh, them for the Philistines on the other side of the kingdom? Anybody know? Yeah, Samson. That's right. That's exactly right. And so while this is taking place, Samson's on the other side of the Jordan uh, doing his business too. And so uh, our number one takeaway, rebellion against God always brings pain and punishment. Uh, the children of Israel had done it before, and, but for some reason they had forgotten that when you go against God's will, when you rebel against Him, it's going to bring pain and punishment. Uh, so many times in this life you see people who um, time and time again inflict pain upon themselves. They inflict pain upon those who are close to them, oftentimes because they live a life contrary to what God has called us to be. Uh, I remember a preacher one time, Ben Flat, telling me that even if religion wasn't true, even if Christianity was a myth, he still believed that the Christian life was the best life. He felt like it was the most fulfilling life because it, it brought a sense of joy and fulfillment and peace. Uh, when we rebel against God's law, it brings pain. It brings broken families. It brings broken homes. It brings uh, dissatisfaction. Dissatisf we're dissatis dis dis sorry. We are dissatisfied with our work. Um, sorry, guys. Um, and so when we rebel against God, it's always going to bring pain and punishment, if not in this life, of course, in the next. And so we can take that away from the children of Israel. And so chapter 11. Now let's read verses uh, 1 through 9 and get a little bit about the background of Jephthah and see about his life. Interesting character. Maybe one of the most interesting judges. Now Jephthah was a Gileadite, Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and the Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows, or vigilantes, or hard fellows, depending on your translation, collected around Jephthah and went out with him. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned to you now, that you may go and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your leader. And so Jephthah was a child of who? A prostitute, right? An illegitimate child. And so he's born to a prostitute and to a, a situation of shame. And so he grows up and his dad has sons already. And uh, you think about the fragile mentality he must have had being the, the child of a prostitute. He grows up and then his half-brothers, do they accept him in because he's an innocent child and it's not his fault? No. And so the only family he really has basically makes him an outcast. And the text tells us that they drive him out. And so not only do they not let him live in peace, they won't even let him live in their vicinity. And so he goes to the land of Tob. And if you look here on our map, if you can see where Gilead is and see Manasseh, if you can see where the purple and the green come together and the territory of the Ammonites right there on the edge, that's where Tob is. And so he's not even really living inside of Israel's bounds. And so he's kind of in this kind of wilderness area, and he's living there, and he's kind of becomes like a gang. 
That's kind of weird, but you know, if you look at it, he's, he's, he basically just, you know, in today's world, I mean, one of the reasons why most young men join gangs is because they have no father figure and they're looking for a sense of family. Well, 3,000 years ago, Jephthah becomes a part of a gang because he has no father figure and he has no family. And so he's joined by, the text here says, worthless men in the ESV. Um, really, they're just, they're just vagabonds. I mean, they're just men from, you know, poor walks of life, uh, bad family homes, and they basically become kind of a gang. And so they live off the land, they steal, they rob, they kill, and they're kind of vigilantes, if you will. And so Jephthah, is, he's a fighter. He's a warrior. He's made a name for himself. And uh, I was reading one commentary, and it likened this story to a Western, uh, where the kid, a kid is born, and they drive him out of the town because they don't like him. And then, like, these bad guys ride in on horses with black hats, and they terrorize the town, and they go and ask for him and his gang to come in and, and to free the town or whatever it is. And so that's kind of what you have here with Jephthah. And so he's a rogue, lonely warrior with a band of warriors. Uh, the uh, people of Gilead say, you know, come and fight for us. You know, if you'll come fight for us, we'll make you the head over all the, the tribe of Gilead. And so he decides to come back and to fight with them. And so if you look on the next few verses, uh, he gives the Ammonite king a history lesson. And so he sends a message to the king of Ammon, and he says, why, why are you trying to... to fight us. You know, why are you trying to take our land? You have no right to be here. And so the Ammonite king says, that land belongs just as much to us as it does to you guys. And Jephthah says, no it doesn't. And he gives them a history lesson. He says, when the children of Israel were leaving the land of Egypt, we asked for safe passage uh, from the king of Moab. And we asked for safe passage uh, from the Amorites. And they didn't give us safe passage. In fact, the Amorites attacked us. And when the Amorites attacked us, we defended ourselves. And we defended ourselves, Yahweh gave us the victory. And as well as you know, when you conquer territory in war from God, who gives it to you, it becomes your territory. I mean, the, one of the reasons why the Moabites, they may have oppressed the children of Israel, but they never tried to get their land back. Even though they were probably bigger and stronger because they were afraid of Yahweh, because it was a... In the ancient Near Eastern world, when you won a, a war, it was seen to be from the hand of the God. And so if you attacked them, it would have been detrimental to you because you were trying to transgress the will of a God. Now remember, these guys are uh, henotheistic, right? They believe in multiple gods. And so that's one of the reasons why you'll see foreign deities or foreign kings talk about Yahweh. And they don't have to give their religion, they can just... They can just give credit to Yahweh for this one thing. And he says, God gave us this land. If you attack us, he says, then God's going to be displeased with your act against him and his will. Number two, we've lived here for 300 years. And so possession is nine-tenths of the law. It's ours. Number three, this was Amorite land. It wasn't even Ammonite land. It wasn't even your place to begin with. And so here he gives them three reasons as to why this is not his land. And so Jephthah tries to do diplomacy. And so here you have this rogue warrior, but he doesn't just ride in town, get an army, and go fight a battle. He first tries diplomacy and says, look, he says, we can fight if you want to fight, but just think about this. You don't really have any reason to be here. Why don't you just go home? And of course, the Ammonite king has no intentions of going home, and so he wants to fight. And so Jephthah goes, he raises an army, and so he fights uh, the Amorites, Ammonites, excuse me, um, and then, during that fight, he makes a brash vow. And so let's read verses uh, 30, and then 33 through 40. Verse 30 of chapter 11, and then 33 through 40. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from my doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Verse 34. And then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with the tambourines and with dances. She was an only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, 
You have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take my vow back. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone for two months, that I may go up and down to the mountains, and weep and pray for my virginity, I and my companions." So he said, Go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed. And she and her companions wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. And she had never known a man. It became a custom in Israel. The daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. And so here, Jephthah makes a brash vow. And so before he goes into the battle, he tries to manipulate God. And he says, Lord, if you will give me this victory, I will give to you a burnt uh, sacrifice. And this really shows the lack of uh, faith that Jephthah had in God. Jephthah is an interesting character because Jephthah mentions Yahweh more than any other judge uh, in the book of Judges. And so uh, he mentions Yahweh more He seems to uh, have an understanding of who Yahweh is, of who God is, which is interesting because it says that all of Israel had forsaken Him. He says, if God gives me the victory, then I will be your head, I will lead you. And so he's humble in that aspect, but it seems to me that his knowledge is one of ignorance. And so he has a strong belief in God, but not according to knowledge, and he tries to negotiate with God. He had negotiated with the elders of the town. He said, look, I'll come back if you'll make me your head and give me the victory. So, okay, he negotiated with the elders. It worked out. He then tries to negotiate with the king of Ammon. It doesn't work out. Then he tries to negotiate with God. And, of course, God is not somebody that you negotiate with. And so when I think about Jephthah, I think about Romans 10 too. And in Romans 10 too, Paul is talking about the Israelites of his day in the first century. And he says, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And basically what he's saying is, they believe in God, they want to serve God, but they don't know how, and it gets them in trouble. Because they don't know what to do. I think about Jephthah here. Uh, Jephthah seems to be a good guy, if you will. He's trying to do the right thing, he's trying to serve God, but he doesn't know the Word of God, and he's trying to treat God like a Canaanite uh, King, a Canaanite God. Uh, oftentimes, even in the Roman world, you go to a seaport and you would make sacrifices to, um, you know, Poseidon to keep you safe in your travels. If you go to an ancient Roman road, they had an altar like every uh, quarter of a mile, and you can make a sacrifice on that altar every quarter of a mile for your safety. You were trying to bribe God, if you will. And so here, Jephthah treats God like he's some Canaanite deity trying to bribe him for victory. Um, And so, uh, unfortunately, he had a a zeal for God, but one that lacked in knowledge. And one of the reasons why is because if he had known the Word of God, if he had known what it had said, when he came home, he would remember Leviticus 27, 1-8, which said, if you make a vow to God, you can buy that vow back. You know, whether it's an animal, whether it's a person, the, the, the law of Moses actually had a stipulation where you could buy back your vow to the Lord. It would cost you monetarily, but you, there was a way around it, if you will. Jephthah didn't know that because he didn't know the Word of God. And so when he sees his daughter, he thinks there's no way out. And so then he sacrifices his daughter. Uh, yes? Uh, Le, uh, Leviticus 27, 1 through 8. Uh, where he could, they could, he could have bought back his sacrifice, his vow that he had pledged to God. And so, what does he expect to walk out the door of his house? And he says, he's obviously as strong as his daughter. What did he think was going to come out of his house that he would the door of his house and his sacrifice? Yeah, and so probably not. His house could probably be translated homestead, you know, like is his place. And so he probably thought it was going to be some sort of animal, you know, whether it was, you know, a donkey. They didn't really have horses at this time in Israel. Uh, a donkey, maybe a cow or a goat or a sheep, you know, kind of like if you go um, maybe like out in the old days in Oklahoma or something like that, you just kind of have like your animals kind of around your house type thing. And so he was probably thinking it was going to be an animal and not a person. Uh, but his daughter probably saw him coming and it ran out to celebrate his victory against this larger uh, kingdom, uh, not knowing that her dad had made this type of vow. And so um, that's, that's probably why he's so distraught. He probably thought he was just seeing an animal the first thing, you know, when he got back.
So, it was a terrible t- judgment call. It was a terrible, you know. Um, first of all, try to bribe God, you know. And um, I wonder how many of us have done the same thing, though, you know, at some point in our life. You know, try to bribe God. You know, Lord, I'll give you, you know, whatever, you know, if you'll give me this. You know, a lot of us have probably... Uh, done a similar mistake of Jephthah trying to bribe God, like like he needs something from us, right? You know, like like God needed that sacrifice, you know, uh, to 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 come through and 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 save his people. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes we think we can we can negotiate with God or manipulate Him. Um, there are two schools of thought. Uh, the first school of thought is that he sacrificed his daughter as a burnt offering, as it said. Um, I lean towards this. Uh, the text to me seems pretty clear that this is what it, it says he did. Um, the other school of thought says that he made her a perpetual virgin. And that's why you have this speech here about virginity. That he did not allow her to get married. And so he sacrificed uh, her ability to have children. And so some people have uh, leaned toward this view because it kind of gets you out of the situation of Jephthah being a judge and sacrificing his daughter, uh, which is a human sacrifice. Um, the only bad thing is this was first began in the 13th century by Jewish commentators. It was picked up in the 14th century by Christian commentators. So the very first uh, suggestion that this took place is about 2,300 years after the fact. And so it seems to me like... Uh, it makes more sense with the text that he actually sacrificed his daughter. Uh, any questions on... Uh, so, yes, Mr. Steve? Yeah. 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 Maybe the reason that people come up with other ideas, maybe it wasn't Yeah. That's the hardest part is the fact that human sacrifice in the Mosaic law is forbidden, you know. And here you've got a judge sacrificing his daughter. And so uh, it's hard. Uh, one, of the, one of the things the Bible does, it doesn't tell us what should have happened, it tells us what happened, you know. And. Um, Jephthah was a valiant person that led uh, the children of Israel against an oppressor. Uh, but uh, just like Samson or somebody else that's also in the Hall of Faith, uh, he, you know, is a man of flaws as well. Um, good, good comment. Good comment. Okay, our, our time is short. And so our second takeaway, not knowing God's Word leads to harmful ignorance. There are many people who want to do what's right, who believe in God, who want to serve Him. But if we don't know what the Bible says, then we're going to find ourselves like Jephthah. If Jephthah would have known Leviticus 27, it would have saved him his daughter's life. Um, But he didn't know the Bible. He didn't know Leviticus 27, so it cost him dearly. If we have hearts that are sincere, but don't know what the Bible says, it will come back to cost us bitterly in the end. There will be a lot of people on the Day of Judgment who will hear the words, I never knew you who lived their life sincerely towards God their entire life, but just never took the time to realize what God's Word had to say. Then in chapter 12, we weren't reading that text because our time is short, but basically the Ephraimites, who were just a bunch of punks. I mean, like, when Gideon comes back from beating the Midianites, the Ephraimites get all upset because they didn't get invited to the party. Like, they're all upset. They didn't want to help, but got really mad when they won, and they weren't part of the group, you know, team picture. And then, same thing happens here, you know, uh, Jephthah tried to get them to come fight. They wouldn't come fight. They get upset, and Jephthah says, You know what? Gideon appeased you guys. I'm just sick and tired of y'all. And so they have a civil war, and the Gileadites kill 42,000 of the Ephraimites. Uh, they asked them to say, uh, uh, They asked them to say Shibboleth, and they say Sibboleth. And so they pronounce it differently. And so they, they're coming across the river, and the Ephraimites are trying to disguise themselves. Like, oh, we're, we're not fighting against you guys. We're just passing through. They say, okay, say ear of corn, which is what that word means. They say it wrong way, and as soon as they say it the wrong way, they kill them. Um, this may sound crazy, but this was actually a tactic that Nazis used in World War II uh, to catch Russian Jews. And so Russian Jews, ironically, corn was a different way they said uh, corn. 
And so um, the Nazis would ask, would ask them to say corn. And depending on what way they said it, they would know that they were a, a Russian Jew, and, uh, which is kind of interesting because the same word, uh, it's, it's a different word, but the corn is what they asked them to at, say here in Judges 12. And the Nazis were asking them to say corn in Russian, uh, which is a word I can't say, but it's, you can look it up on, on, online. Um, and so peace is kept for a few years. We have these three judges. Ibzan judges seven years, Elon ten years, and then Abdon for eight years. And so these men succeeded Jephthah. Uh, on the other side of the river, Samson is going to be judging uh, the children of Israel against the Philistines. And we're going to see that take place here uh, next week. The third takeaway is division among God's people always brings casualties. Uh, here it brought physical ca uh, casualties with the Ephraimites and also with the Gileadites. Um, but whenever we are divided and not doing what God wants us to do, it brings pain. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and end in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings you've given us. We're so thankful for your word. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to learn from the mistakes of those who have gone on before us, uh, to learn from uh, the things they did well, their courage that they had uh, to go into battle uh, for you. Uh, give us that type of courage in our world today. Dear Heavenly Father, but help us to also learn from the mistakes they made of not knowing your word. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that your word is eternal, that it will judge us in the last day. Dear Heavenly Father, please give us the uh, the motivation to study that word, to make sure that our lives are in accordance with that word, that we can have a blessed life here in this life, but also a blessed life in eternity with you in heaven. We're so thankful for the opportunity that we have through Christ to live with you for all of eternity. And please watch over us and bless us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.